interdisciplinary series at the Center for Translation Studies. Uh, we are very happy to host today my friend and colleague, who is Associate Professor of Francophone Studies at the, and Director of the Middle East Studies Program at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. Her research interests and teaching include Francophone and Postcolonial Studies, Women Writing, Art and Politics, and Middle Eastern Literature and Culture. She is the author of the, several books, um, uh, one uh, being The Unspeakable Representations of Trauma in Francophone Literature and Art, uh, another Témoignage Fictionnel au Féminin, Une réécriture des Blancs de la Guerre Civile Algérienne, and Friction et Devenir dans les Écritures Migrantes et Féminin, au Féminin, en Racinement et that's another one. No, it's the same. It's, it's a very same. long time. Same, yeah. We shouldn't Semi have this time. <laughs> a very prolific, as you can see. And today's talk is actually based on her ongoing uh, book, expected out by next year. And it's obviously going to be on uh, women and the Tunisian Revolution. And her talk today is entitled Translating Defiance into Art, Tunisian Women's Revolution. Thank you very much, Samia, for inviting me. Thank you for all of you to come. I'm very, oops, I moved it, so something happened. Oops, do we have a... I just moved yeah. it, uh, 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 so I, I, I shouldn't be moving it at all. Okay, okay, so I will try my best not to move. Anything. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much for inviting me and uh, I'm very happy to be here and uh, I just came yesterday, I arrived at midnight so if I'm a little bit spacey, please forgive me. <laughs> I actually slept maybe one hour tonight so it will be challenging for me to <laughs> concentrate. So anyway. Uh, I, I changed a little bit the title because it, it's kind of uh, reflecting on what exactly I'm, I'm presenting today, the Margaret Archive and Tunisian Women Revolutionary Art. So in the wake of uh, major events that have shaken the Middle East and North Africa since the Arab Springs, politically engaged women artists have increasingly come to characterize a key new direction in art production. This presentation tackles some compelling questions that have not been examined through a comparative and multidisciplinary perspective. What role do art and artists play in society today? How do women artists address, engage with, and negotiate specific political issues? And according to them, how can art uh, help foment social and cultural changes? And most importantly, how archiving gender politicized forms of creativity is an act of defiance in itself. The perpetual confrontations with totalitarian regimes, Islamist influence, and conservative patriarchal means in addressing women's rights in the Middle East and North Africa have prompted women to find alternative artistic ways to cope with political and national disenchantment. My main contention in this study is that the Arab uprisings constitute, among other epistemic incentives, a powerful catalyst for women to be more engaged within the political realm and to develop new approaches to mobilize awareness and action through a creativity. In order to shed light on overlooked aspects of social political transformations. This is not to suggest that female artists uh, were apolitical before the Arab revolutions, nor do I intend to offer an oversimplification that does not take into consideration social cultural complexities along with power relations that have existed decades before the Arab uprisings. Mainly, I argue that certain historical events and predicaments draw the politicization of not only artists but even their audiences thereby reconfiguring social, political, economic, and cultural re uh, relationships worldwide within a communal sphere where art and politics, artists 
and their audiences interact, it is as if these turbulences give a unique opportunity for art to become a tool to fight against tyranny. Today's presentation is part of a book project through which I will examine different creative forms and genres such as graffiti, multimedia artworks, street performances and literary text embraced by Tunisian and Egyptian women to stimulate political and social consciousness and to invigorate critical thinking. Both countries were devastated by socio-political and economic instabilities uh, due to massive popular uprisings that not only toppled the presidents, but brought socio-political changes and most importantly, cultural and artistic renovations, if not revolutions. The period that I am interested in germinated just a few days after the Jasmine Revolution and the Tahrir Square settings in January 12, and remains vibrant today, even if, as I will demonstrate in my book, several forces, either institutional, ideological, or economic, are still fiercely attempting to dismantle the powerful energy. The study also demonstrates how their contributions are drastically challenging commonly held and outdated perceptions of Arab women that still persist in the Arab world and beyond. The mass uprisings in Tunisia and Egypt, as well as in Libya and Iraq, brought down not only auto autocratic regimes, but also common misconceptions and cultural stereotypes regarding women's uh, role throughout the Middle East and North Africa. For the purpose of today's presentation, I will focus on two Tunisian artists, Jalila Bakar and Hela Amar, who were among uh, the many artists whose creativity was invigorated with the 2011 Tunisian Revolution. The culture of Tunisia is thousands of years old, but the Jasmine Revolution brought about important changes to the way art and politics interact in Tunisia. Censorship under the dictatorship, the dictatorship of former President Zemil Abdin Ben Ali was replaced with unprecedented freedom of expression and questions on how to use uh, art. The revolution saw an upshot in the number of artistic manifestations such as uh, uh, street art, theatrical performances, and exhibits. Other art forms such as music also strived after the revolution. Since the, onset, uh, since the onset of the Arab Spring, the works produced between 2011 and 15 by a number of artists seem to be clearly reflecting an art that, in an evolving challenge to reach out to more and more people, is progressively transformed into a, revol a revolutionary machine in the most significant definition of Deleuze's revolutionary becoming which is also bringing new meanings and purposes of the public sphere. In this regard, the classic notion of uh, Habermas of the political public sphere has to be undeniably questioned since it neglects important social and political conditions of contemporary uh, non-Western societies, while also focusing on a historically specific and limited form of the public sphere, which he calls I quote him, the liberal model of the bourgeois public sphere, end of quote. According to him, the idea of a public sphere is that of a body of private persons assembled to discuss matters of public concern or common interest, while the sphere of the state and the economics were not interfering. However, the Arab uprisings clearly dismantled this enforced separation of civil society and the state when we witness on Tahrir Square in Egypt or Taksim Square in Turkey, men and women from different classes, races, ethnicities, and ideologies deliberating among themselves about their needs, objectives, and strategies, they cons constituted what Nancy Fraser dubbed competing publics, which I quote her, better promote the ideal of participatory parity that does a single, comprehensive, overarching public, end of quote. <coughs> <coughs> Since its inception, contemporary art theater has shown a political dimension, especially since the 60s, 
where playwrights, directors, and actors work together to forge a revolutionary movement. The artists set out to change the world through theater and through their works they thought to create a situation that stimulates action. For many, the priority was to state the mechanism of power in order to dismantle its membranes and offer other alternative means to subvert gender dynamics and abuse of power in general. But since the onset of the Arab uh, Springs, the theater scene strive as many other artistic forms and seem to be clearly reflecting a very unique creative movement whose orientation is of an ethical, aesthetic nature. Artists became more and more aware of their social role as agents of changes and as social critiques. A profusion of, critic, uh, of theatrical uh, performances saw the day with the Arab Springs. As Nahid Saleha stated, I quote her, a rich crop of performances that taught the, to salvage, document, and store in the collective memory the stories of the people, both living and dead, through narrative and first and second hand live testimonies, end of quote. Just to name but a few, from Egypt, uh, Solitaire, a woman, a one woman a multimedia performance, or Nora Amin, the, uh, the title of her uh, uh, performance, the, the Maybe of the Revolution, or Dalia Bassiouni's Tahrir Stories, on Laila Suleiman, Not Time for Art. Uh, not Time for Art. And from Tunisia, uh, El Saura by Alia Suleimani, and Revolution by Hatem Karawi, Antigone by Alifa Shouet, and Co Intellectual by Haifa Boatour. In Tunisia, and since the 60s, a national theater was established, and under Habib Bourguiba, theater was encouraged as an, as an expression of national consciousness. When Zen Ben Ali took power over in 1987, he claimed to be interested uh, in continuing Bourguiba's legacy, but his regime was in fact more autocratic and repressive, and theater was the only culture uh, form officially subject to censorship. So Jalila Bakar was among the many artists who, whose creativity, even if it was very much known as being quite political before 2011 Tunisian revolution, became more engaged within these competing publics and through which performances were functioning as a powerful collective practices of citizenship, generating new possibilities for citizens to become engaged in political action. <coughs> Moreover, and as I previously argued, the clear-cut clear separation of the public sphere and the state was not possible anymore in these acti activist performances which became key indicators of the transformation of the public sphere, blurring the distinction between citizen and consumer. Hence, theater was transformed into a battleground of competing publics that struggled for public attention. <coughs> Jalila Bakar is a playwright, uh, actress of theater, film and television. In 1976, she founded with uh, Father Jaibi who became her husband and lifelong collaborator, the new theater, uh, Al Masrah Al Jadid, as the first independent professional company in the country. Their theater was very much influenced by the French and German independent theater movements. And since 1998, Bakar wrote plays uh, that Jaibi put on scene. They both have long fought for a citizen theater as a tool for social and political dissent that eludes hierarchy, hierarchy and power structure of the state. A la recherche d'Aida, in, in search of Aida, her first play, play was published in 1998 and translated by Fadel Jaibi. In 2003, Arab Berlin was published, dealing for the first time with political concerns outside the Arab world and the tension between the Arab world and the West in the wake of 9-11.
For today's presentation, <coughs> I will focus on uh, one of Bakar's play, Yahya Yaish, Amnesia, which is the second of a trilogy that was written in 2009 and shown for the first time in 2010. Khamsun, Kohotaj, is the first of the trilogy staged in 2006, and Tsunami is the last uh, one presented uh, in 2014. Yahya Yaish uh, greatly exemplifies my main contention by introducing a change in the way art and more specifically theater cope with the socio-political unrest. Jalil Abakar's play depicts, as I argue here, the intermingling of theater and reality as an important pa part of the dynamics of the Tunisian revolution. In other words, the play transformed the stage into, into an alive archive, a performative reenactment of the revolution in order to document and store in the collective memory the stories of the people. Also, I would like to draw on the work of American studies scholar Pia Wigming, who describes theatrical performers as actor citizens who make use of symbolic political acts in order to make their agenda visible to a wider public. In this regard, these actors are to be considered as staging activist performance, what Wigming defines, I quote, as a form of political action which is located outside the political consensual realm of party politics as it is not institutionally affiliated with parties, unions, and other organizations, activist performance can be conceived as the temporary formation of a counter-public which both aesthetically as well as ideologically defies prevailing dominant political discourses." End of quote. Moreover, these activist performances have to, have to be considered as acts of dissent. As Chantal Mouffe points out, I quote, consensus is no doubt necessary, but it must, it must be accompanied by dissent. Consensus is needed on the institutions constitutive of democracy and on the ethnico-political uh, values informing the political association. Liberty and equality for all, but there will always be disagreement concerning their meaning and the way they should be implemented. In a pluralist, pluralist democracy, such disagreements are not only legitimate, but also necessary. They provide the stuff of democratic politics." End of quote. Yahya Yaish was written by Jalila Bakar and Fadel Jaibi and was cleared for a premiere in 2010 at Le Mondial Festival in Tunis. But when they were touring with the play in the autumn, they heard about the unthinkable events that were devastating Tunisia. In a few months, changes in the political situation in Tunisia transformed the text from a premonitory dream to a documentary play, an alive archive, when ironically, the play's reenactment took a different turn. The connections between Yahya, the main character in the play, and the runaway president Zen el Abdin Ben Ali had become rather evident. It was the most significant theater piece to address the fall of the dictator just before the Arab Spring. The play begins with the actors making their way through the audience before going on stage. Once there, they start to, to stare at the public under the spotlights for more than 15 minutes. An inversion of roles between actors and spectators does take place who is actually on stage, who is the actor, and where does the play take place. The remediation of revolution in performance through Yahya Yaish was revealing the material conditions and geographic locations of the Tunisian unrest, which witnessed a dialectical oscillation between the inside and the outside. And an inside closed up on itself was not possible anymore. Neither Habermas model of a public sphere. Then the actors disappear uh, backstage and reappear to sit on white chairs. The extensive use of chairs as a travel index metaphorically hints at power positions as well as power abuse. 
The performers are shaken from time to time by spasm as if they were crossed by flashes of lucidity or repressed nightmares. The plot, the plot is developed around Yahya, a political leader, probably head of the state, who ends up uh, falling in present in his own tyrannical system. Yahya appears uh, on stage celebrating the birthday of his daughter, Dora, but he is constantly asking about time as if awaiting some news. Then his wife breaks in and puts an end to the birthday party. She brings the devastating news of his dismissal from the ministry and detention at home, shouting they dismissed him. A whole cycle of nightmarish descent follows. Yahya is not charged with a, a crime, but is no longer allowed to leave his house, and by extension, the country, because of what he knows about, uh, about state sec secrets. And because of his depression, he is taken to the hospital for mental problems. From this moment, the days of Yahya will pass confronting his captors, who will take their place next to his bed, while his restless nights will be populated by the wandering shadows of the victims of his disastrous policies. He makes uh, his final exit symbolically in an armchair, facing the charges of his previous victims. If the play is an evident parody of a modern dictator who, who becomes entrapped in a Kafka uh, nightmare of importance, it also expresses a, a distinct political command and a deliberate aesthetic choice through this inherently performative play that stages its politics in public as an act of dissent, drawing attention to specific political circumstances and inequalities, in short, political issues that they feel are not adequately discussed in governmental or party politics. It is noteworthy to underscore that the first time the play was staged in Tunisia in April and May 2010, the public opened their eyes wide and were frightened. I quote, some people were constantly turning around to check that uh, there were no uh, members of the political police in the room to arrest everyone, actors and spectators included, end of quote. Recall Fadel Jaibi, once the dream of the fall of Ben Ali became reality, Jalila Bakar and Fadel Jaibi did not wish to retouch the play, rewrite it according to the events of January 14. The show was replayed as it is in Tunis and was sold out at the Mondial, while the adjac uh, adjacent streets bloody uh, events were occurring. Sounds of bombs and, sh and shots were heard. And this is when the boundaries between street protest and what was taking place inside the theater started to blur. Karim El Kefi, an actor in the production, stated, I quote him, we played in a theater next to the Minister of Interior and protesters used to uh, use the building as a refuge. We were inundated by tear gas. Spectators could no longer distinguish between nightmare and reality. End of quote. The actor-spectator dichotomy at this point was uh, invaded by a third element, the street, and what happened outside the theater. The reenactment of the revolution has made the audience become significant participant of the play uh, uh, of the play of public dis dissidents. The play is also linked to the question of memory, since for Jalila Bakar it was a question of archiving the events so that Tunisians would not forget the values but also the historical moments of, uh, that they went through during their struggle for democracy. democracy. Uh, so I would now uh, turn on to my second example. They went through during their relentless struggle for independence and later on democracy. While Taras uh, serves as a reminder of the Tunisian values that have marked the country's history, the second artwork stresses the archival nature of Hela Amar's art. The Woven Archives is a set of photographs on which red satin stitches are literally intertwined on the image. To collect the pictures, Ammar drew on what 
was left of the family archives, some archive footage from uh, coming from private collection that friends uh, have, let, uh, have let her exploit, while others were taken from the internet. Each image represents a significant period uh, of the Tunisian history. We see succeeding the, bay, the last Bay of Tunis and the four presidents of the Republic, as we find references to nationalist movements like protests against the French protectorate or women's movement for liberation, thus offering a political reading of the collective as well as a, a personal history. It is worth not noticing that the embroidery of the red threads creates a unified chronicle, illustrating continuity between the past and the present as an attempt to link together the fragments of shattered uh, memories. Furthermore, the choice of embroidery and the color of the thread is not in insignificant. Red is the color of the national flag, but also symbolizes the blood that has been spread to achieve independence and equality. Let's remember that embroidery as a lar largely female handcraft creativity has been as central to the cultural heritage uh, throughout the Arab world as calligraphy, woodwork, ceramics, or silverware. Embroidered textiles have been produced for thousands of years across North Africa and the Middle East to decorate public buildings, homes, and animals, as well as to clothe men, women, and children. They have played an important role in the social and cultural lives of communities and people, and have reflected the economic and political change, uh, changes that have affected the region from the earliest time. Moreover, and because embroidery is an art that evokes patience and ardor, and therefore requests long hours of labor, its blending with photograph implies the arduous effort undertaken by the people to achieve their purposes. Another artistic exploration that Amar worked on is to ask the women who did the embroidery to undo her work. The video entitled Sayida, uh, Saadiya, I mean, stages uh, an embroiderer who makes and undo the world freedom, dignity, work, and justice. Uh, referring to the long process Tunisians uh, are going through of deconstructing and reconstruction of the values of the republic. Thus, the, con uh, the concept, uh, let me just think. Thus, the concept of an alternative archive is part of Amar's concept of art, since the history of Tunisia has been largely confiscated by the two, uh, the last two authoritarian regimes, which have written their own version of history, aiming uh, at a patrimonial, monumental in instrumentalization <coughs> of the official memory. As Amar observes concerning national archives, I quote, from 1999, they were centralized in a modern building in accordance with the norms of indexing and of conservation of archival documents. To my great regret, I learned that the National Archives didn't have the means to acquire them because above all, it is about private collections put on sale, nor to ensure their conversation, uh, conservation, end of quote. Many political archives have been destroyed or made inaccessible, and most of the national archives are still accessible only with permission. At the same time, and when it comes to art, the state has worked towards a systematic marginalization of contemporary artistic creation and artistic her heritage as well. And even if a commission was created by the Ministry of Culture to acquire artworks on behalf of the state, Yet, once torn, these artwork were badly preserved and remain, and remain until now inaccessible to the public. <laughs> this was what a large part of civil society was demanding. Activists, artists, and citizens have been campaigning since the beginning of the Tunisian Revolution for the opening of the secret police archives in order to bring to light the dark heels of the dictatorship. 
If archival material, either personal, familiar, or national, is a tangible, everlasting trace of the past, that can thus be accidentally uh, or intentionally destroyed, or deteriorated with time, or just lost, as Ammar explains. <coughs> The red stitches on the old pictures constitute uh, symbolic gestures to mark them with the present traces that emphasizes their significance, but also build the link between the past and the, the, past and the present. Their superimposition <coughs> even implies that official archives are not of interest of only historians or, or researchers, but they could serve to recollect personal memories too. Official archives are used by artists so to give them greater visibility and re-examine them from a different angle. And this is, uh, and this way, the personal becomes political as well. By using archival photographs that represent uh, various historical moments of Tunisia, Ahmad constructed a site of memory that resists oblivion. Ammar literally embroidered archival images, private and official, but also her own photographs to better understand the imprint left by the image on the Tunisian revolution in her memory. These photographs can be also read, uh, can be also read as not simply a reproduction of the past, because some of them have been manipulated and sometimes dis distorted to the extent that their factual nature is altered, questioning thus one, uh, how one more, and if archive is nothing but a reconstruction, a restoration brought about afterwards, the memory itself, as it, uh, as it was on the date it was made, is therefore sealed off, lost forever. This is what Jacques Derrida called archive fever, le mal d'archive is that they are often impossible to find, or in any case, inaccessible. But at the same time, the emotional burden is even stronger because it is amplified by time. And this is what also uh, archive fever, mal d'archive, could also refer to. We are in need of the archives. Mal d'archive literally means in need of archives. These memorial claims that Hela Ammar created can also be considered as, I quote, sensitive archive, a concept that crosses the contributions of Michel Foucault, Archéologie du Savoir, and Jacques Rancière, Le Partage du Sensible. A sensitive archive is a work that concerns intimate memories, individual, family, or collective ones, a work that, in this sense, confronts with emotional realities as a source of knowledge. <laughs> the, sensitive the sensitive archive offers an original insight in, into the role of individuals and actors in historical processes, a dimension often neglected by the historians because of the positivist legacy that opposes discourse and affect subjectivity and truth. The sensitive archive does not invite so much to privilege the effect against knowledge or truth, but to question this separation. The sociopolitical transformation of the public sphere are still unfolding in Tunisia. And as I tried to demonstrate, art is more and more engaged in the sociopolitical debates that are still restructuring the country. Art and politics, therefore, need a common ground for both to be sustained. This is not finally about art as a form of political protest, nor is this to confuse the artist as protester and vice versa. Rather, it is about the potential of art as a practice to open up our horizons of possibility for civic imaginations to emerge and be thereafter supported within a network of social relations that are not precluded by the dictates of politics or institutions. The Tunisian revolution re-energized art within its social and cultural potentials, which were already vigorous but needed as part for momentum. 
So thank you very much. Thank you, Nina, so, for a fascinating you. talk. Thank you. Also refreshing that was again <laughs> talking about uh, uprisings, which we have stopped doing here. I think. <laughs> um, and wonderful examples, really. And uh, Thank the work you. is uh, very interesting. Then maybe we can open it up for questions. Yeah. I think 10 to 15 <coughs> minutes left. Well, I'll ask a question. Sure. Take a first chat. Um, in your example of the Delida Baka, uh, I saw that the title of the jacket is in French. Mm -hmm. So my question is, you know, what role does language play? What, what? The role does language play <coughs> yeah. in, you know, art production in general, whether it be you know, visual or uh, performative. Yeah. Uh, and what is the relationship to French in yeah. this revolutionary context? Yeah, thank you. It's a good question because actually, uh, to my surprise, the three uh, plays were uh, played first outside of Tunisia. Uh -huh. And I mean, not to my surprise, because obviously we know the role of censorship. So they were played first in uh, some uh, 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 festivals in France, and they were played in Arabic there. But they were accompanied by, you know, uh, like a, a translation of uh, the, the plays. And then uh, Jalila Bakar herself, actually, uh, she's very stick to the idea that for her, theater has to uh, be in Arabic, especially when it comes to this kind of, uh, you know, very close relationship with the audience. So what, what she, she does most of the time, she would play, uh, she would lead her play in, in, in Arabic, and then uh, uh, Jaibi, her partner and, uh, you know, um, and uh, uh, translator, he would put the play again in, into French. But most of the plays were, play, were uh, taking place in Arabic and outside, as I said, sometimes in French. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, for her, it was uh, from the beginning very um, obvious and very evident that uh, uh, in order to reach out to as many as possible, she has to, 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 to play and to especially uh, the do theater in Arabic. So as we all know, for instance, you know, um, there's uh, many other right, uh, like writers and uh, playwrights who start to write in Arabic, like Tahrir al Jalun, and then you will start to do some plays in, 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 in French. But uh, for her, from the beginning, uh, she really uh, wanted to have it in Arabic. And most of her other plays uh, are published in both languages. And sometimes you can find the bilingual version of the plays in the same book, which is really very interesting to put them together. And was there a linguistic shift after the revolution? <coughs> did she, no, actually. Did she actually produced them in French prior after to the revolution? Prior, before. yeah, yeah, before. Yeah, so yeah. there was a linguistic shift? Uh, shift no, but she was always shifting uh, to, uh, in, into the most languages uh, since the 60s, actually. Ah, okay. She has been yeah playing uh, and staging some of her plays in Arabic, and then when she would go Abroad, for instance, uh, Jaibi would translate the play, and then it will be also uh, <coughs> published, like in a bilingual, uh, uh, you know, uh, bilingual edition of the work. But, yeah. yeah. It's always uh, lovely to hear about the, the role that art might play in imagining a more beautiful future or any kind of future at all these days. Um, I, 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 I don't what you're saying about staging performative activism. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought I understood you to say that it's not only a matter of the actors staging it, but somehow the audience becomes implicated in the... Uh, yeah. I, can you say a little more, more about that? I'm not quite sure what you meant. I mean, because they're in the theater, as the difference between consumers and citizens, what we, yeah. talked, we were talking yeah. about, we're going to those lines. So, yeah. so rather than just going to the theater and being amused or something, yeah, as I said, uh, 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 yeah, 
And especially, of course, uh, I mean, since uh, we all know that a lot of uh, creative expression took place within, you know, the sphere of the the public sphere, and then there was the in Tahrir Square. Even we we saw this kind of intermingling between, uh, you know, the the, the 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 actors and the audiences. But in this specific Yahya Yaish, what happened? It was really fascinating because at the moment that she was staging you know the play they started shooting and having tear gas happening in, inside so at this particular moment it's a symbolic gesture that as if the audiences they were really beca becoming like a, a participant in the revolution in a sense and they didn't actually know that was there was tear gas they thought it's part of the play so this was like the reenactment <laughs> of what was going outside this is why i'm saying that um, that uh, I think that one of the uh, like outcomes of the revolutions everywhere is that uh, the blurring between the, the public and the, and, and the private. That, uh, and more and more, I have been you know interviewing a lot of uh, young women who have been participating in a lot of.